we've taken the definition of a subluxation, um, obviously you've realised that by now, far beyond the, uh, the notion of a two joints, two, two bones that have, that have got into a, into a bit of a bind. Okay, we see that as being fairly uh, kindergartenish with what we now know about the nervous system. Okay, so to us, the subluxation is represented by an, an, an inability of the, of the brain at various levels, but particularly the cortex and the cerebellum, the brain to be able to um, uh, synthesize the sensory input and create a, an appropriate motor outflow. Okay, that to us, that, that's, that's what we represent as the, as the subluxation as opposed to an L5 PRS or an ASRA. We, we see those things as being, as being the effect of the subluxation as opposed to the subluxation. So I, I don't want to get the terminology, making a mess of the terminology here. I want to try to keep it fairly simple. I think that the point is that, that this afferentation or the, or the process of afferentation is the reception of sensory input, the um, synthesis of it, of, of, of that at various brain levels and the response in the corticospinal system to keep the body in functional balance. Is that okay? Everybody think that's pretty spot on? All right. I don't think there's anything there to argue with. Disafferentation used to be called deafferentation, which is a bad term because it suggests that the afferentation is not, not happening. The afferentation is happening, but it's happening aberrantly and so the motor response that you are getting is, um, is inappropriate for the sensory input that you've got and so muscles go into shortened status and you get fixation in vertebra and you also get changes in muscles, connective tissue, fascia, organs, whatever you like. So in point of fact, to expand your mind, any structure in the human body is capable of being negatively impacted by disafferentation. Is that a fair comment? That means that we need a system um, where we can actually follow a logical step-by-step -step diagnostic protocol that will lead us to that spot that we can make the adjustment. In the early days, one of our guys, who's an English fellow, he's in Tang Chiang Mai, and uh, he was studying this, and this was a big revelation to him, that you could actually work centrally from the central axis and work diagnostically to a point where you could actually say, oh, the subluxation's there. And he had an Australian businessman up there who had looked him up and uh, he, the, the guy was that excited, I thought he was going to, um, you know, pee his pants. He, he came and he said, you know what, he said, he said, I saw the most amazing thing. This fellow had tinnitus. And he had tinnitus from after he'd had a fall. And he said, well, I worked through the protocol and I was getting a bit panicky because it was taking me to the upper limb and then down the upper limb and I was running out of joints. And he said, I got to the, down here and got to a lunate and he said, I, I, I was palpating his lunate. He said, as I was palpating his lunate, he said, don't take your thumb off there, he said, it stopped the tinnitus. And he said, I adjusted his lunate and it stopped it. Now, tinnitus will not always respond to a lunate. Don't go home punching <laughs> lunates, okay? This, it doesn't function like that. Um, and around about that same time, a little girl that I still see um, now, she's not a little girl now, she's 16, but several years ago as we were working our way through this thing, this little girl came and she was eight years old and all she wanted to do was gymnastics. I guess if you're an eight-year-old girl, you want to do gymnastics. I don't know why, but you know, they seem to, or ride horses or whatever. She wanted to do gymnastics with her friends, but couldn't because she had a so-called shortening of her, of her Achilles. So she basically walked like that. <clears throat> and she came in and she had a rotation in that joint there. Okay, the metacarpophalangeal joint, number two. And she had a rotation in that joint right there like that, in her right hand, which is significant. And uh, she's eight years old, she was a bit intimidated by the whole process. We adjusted her finger here and she started into gymnastics two weeks later. She actually walked with her heel flat for the first time in her life in the, in the clinic before she left. 
Now, my money, I'm not trying to tell you spectacular things to say it's always like that because it's not. But this, um, this rotation here had, had locked this thing up and when she came back, she came back, though, everybody was beaming, she was now doing gymnastics with her mates and all that, it was great. When she came back, she handed me a note and it was a lovely thank you note from her mum and underneath that, she had written a thank you note and on the bottom she wrote, P.S. I've still got the note. On the bottom it said, P.S. I wrote this with my right hand. Well, that meant nothing to me. So the next time she was in, I said to her, what does that mean? And her mother started to laugh and she said, she's right-handed, but she's never been able to control a pen with that finger till the day you adjusted that joint. And she said, now she's able to write quite freely with her right hand. Do you know how important that is? If you're right-handed and you're trying to do all your writing left-handed, you're screwing your brain up, man. That's a bad thing to do. And uh, at any rate, that little girl today is 16 and is maybe more interested in other things now. Um, <laughs> but uh, but she's, uh, that changed things very radically for her. And uh, sometimes you see these very rapid sort of changes. Now, the, the point that is that the way that soft tissue or muscular work has been presented to us, or the way, at least the way it was presented to me, and I know the way it was presented at RMIT when I was teaching there, was basically stripping muscles, you know, effleurage and uh, massage and all that sort of stuff and trigger point therapy. And the, the reason for doing it was fairly vague, but maybe if, the, if you've got some symptoms there, maybe that's the thing to do. <clears throat> it's not how it is at all. The, a muscle compartment syndrome is very much uh, a, a problem that's bearing on the cortex. It's measurable, it's definite, and you can go, with, with great intention, you can actually go and find that problem and adjust it, and it will change all sorts of fixation throughout the spine. You can have a person who just simply can't extend their lumbar spine, they're stuck in, in, in inflection, you go and do the muscular compartment syndrome on the, on the pelvic floor, and you now have completely normal extension right throughout the lumbar spine. You lose flexion because you've got a QL problem. You go and adjust your QL. You don't strip it and, 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 and invade the muscle. You simply go in, find the um, painful point and thrust on the painful point. One NIP thrust. You've got to get the idea of backing off and being light. 